evening. Welcome to One Step Beyond with me, Theo Chalmers. If you have questions for my guest, text them to 86686 with the word beyond, a space and then your message, and we'll pick up on the good ones. They're all charged at standard rate. Once again, we're going to continue the show online tonight for a second hour for subscribers to Edge Extra at edgemediatv.com. My guest tonight is a nuclear radiation expert, author and lecturer. Our show will focus on man-made nuclear pollution and its permanent effects on health for generations to come, engendered by faulty, exploding, leaking nuclear power stations, the now extensive and deliberate poisoning of target populations and our troops, with the use of so-called depleted uranium munitions, and even, it is now rumoured, enriched uranium-235, anti-personnel munitions. We'll also reveal the intensive media cover-ups which serve only to protect the military-industrial complex and be prepared to learn about the bitter harvest we have sown for generation after generation and what you can do to protect you and yours. This is one expert whose globally recognised academic qualifications, peer-reviewed papers and expert witness testimony in court mark him out as a man whose deep knowledge of the subject cannot reasonably be challenged. Knowledge gained here might one day even save your life as you take one step beyond with my guest, Professor Dr. Christopher Busby. Uh, welcome. Hello. I've just uh, performed a strange operation on my computer here. Um, so, you're an expert on nuclear radiation. And health. And health. Uh, explain how you became such. Well, by accident, really. Um, I, it, what happened was that I was living in Wales shortly after the Chernobyl accident and uh, I was out fishing and, and I, I got rained on um, and shortly after that we were told that there was quite a lot of radioactivity in Wales and I had already been a bit concerned about radioactivity in, in an earlier existence where I, when I, in the 60s as we all were then concerned about the possibility that there might be a, a, an all-out nuclear war so we, le we learned a little bit about it then in order to protect ourselves. Um, I was trained as a physical chemist, and so I was fairly reasonably uh, able to understand the, the, the background uh, to all of this. And shortly after that, uh, I became, in Wales, concerned about the way in which the government continually was saying that the radioactivity from Chernobyl couldn't harm anybody. Uh, and we heard at round about that time we'd, we'd heard that there were increases in childhood leukemia near the nuclear site in Sellafield mm -hmm. and uh, the government was also saying, uh, following various uh, um, advice from, from nuclear industry scientists, that, 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 that the childhood leukemia cluster at Sellafield couldn't possibly be caused by the radiation from Sellafield. Now to me that seemed totally counterintuitive, counter it seemed ins insane that, that we know that childhood leukemia is caused by radi radiation exposure and here we have the largest uh, operating site producing radioactivity and uh, the children living there have high levels of leukemia and it was somehow to believe that the, the, the thing isn't connected so I started to look into it and that's when I first walked into this quicksand which is the science of radiation risk. I can tell you it's a very complicated business it involves a lot of subjects. And you're now an expert witness in cases? Oh yes I win cases. I won cases, uh, several cases against the British government involving nuclear test uh, veterans and also in the United States, where, where quite large amounts of money are involved, people have been exposed. So these nuclear test veterans, well, there's Christmas Island and places like This sort of thing, yeah, Maralinga, Christmas Island, what, what Australia happened? Australia, uh, yeah, that's sure. Maralinga, is it? Maralinga is in, uh, yeah, the, the earlier tests were done in Australia, and then later on, when they were making the huge, the huge bombs, of the, the megaton bombs, they shifted the operation to Christmas Island. And of course, a lot of poor squaddies, national servicemen, went out there to help. And, or so uh, they thought. Well, well, they didn't really know what was, ha what was happening. They, they just had to go where they were sent, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and so later on, of course, they all started to suffer from, from cancer and other sorts of ill health. And in fact, as I found doing a study on these people, their children suffered from high levels of congenital malformation, which is also something that radiation produces. So, so yeah, so, that, so I did these cases for these nuclear test veterans. Yeah, sure. And you won them? Yes, so far I've won every single one. <laughs> How many have there been? Um, 
about 10, I suppose, that I won, and there's 16 to go. I mean, the Ministry of Defence got really, really upset about the fact that I kept winning them one after another. So, that, so sometime last year, they put all of the remaining 16 into a bag and decided to have them all in one go. Well, like a class action. Uh, kind of, kind of like that, yeah. But I think they didn't want, they didn't, you see, it's quite easy to prove, where you've got only one veteran and you can take that particular case, you can focus on what happened to that person and you can create a, a reasonably good uh, expert witness statement which you can defend. Mm -hmm. um, but when you have 16 of them in a bag, it's really much more difficult to do. And so the Treasury solicitor had to uh, try to have me thrown out as an expert witness, but he didn't succeed. So, so I'm still on the case, and the case should be heard now. The idea is it's been heard sometime early next year. Mm. The, okay. With the 16. The other but can, you, can the 16 not object and say, well, actually, we want to be... I did say all this. I said it was quite ridiculous. And then, interestingly enough, also, in, in, uh, with regard to this case, is I've been ha we've been having great difficulty in getting any evidence out of the Ministry of Defence. They, they, a lot of this stuff is kept secret, yeah. all of these records. Because, of course, you know, the case is about whether somebody's been exposed or not, right? So you would think, in a normal action, that you would be allowed to demand documentation to say, well, they've measured, you know, what, what they've measured at Christmas Island and all that, but they keep it secret, you see? But what you're, in your previous ten cases... Yeah, in, the, in those cases, I, I still won without knowing this stuff. I managed to get enough evidence together to show that, 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 that these people had been exposed. And the key, the, the key point is that the, the government believed they weren't exposed because they, they, have, they used to wear film badges, which is like a little badge with the photographic film. And it would fog uh, and, if, it was, and, if there was radiation. Fog, yes, exactly. And so by the amount of fogging, you can tell how much radiation they got, you see. But the trouble is it only works for gamma radiation. And, the, and as I figured out quite early on, the problem is not the gamma radiation. The problem is the internal inhaled and ingested radiation from alpha emitters like plutonium and uranium. After all, the bombs were made of uranium. But nobody ever mentions the amount of uranium that was involved. Each bomb was about one tonne of uranium. So when it goes bang, you know, uranium goes everywhere. And it's as we know around. from the Gulf War, uranium is a very serious mutant. Mutagenic. Yes. Well, 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 we'll, we'll talk about that. So, but, I mean, let's just wrap up the, 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 the legal cases that you're fighting then. So you've got some evidence. I mean, obviously they're not denying that they had nuclear explosions on. No, they're just saying that the doses that these people received were too low to cause any effect. That's but, what they say. But do you not know how, the kilotonnage or, or <coughs> yeah, we know how much, the size of the explosion? We, we know the size of the explosion is how many megatons and whatnot. But the, the, the point is what they say is that the, the bombs were exploded in the air above Christmas Island when the wind was blowing away from the island. And so very little stuff actually fell on the island. Um, but, but what they measured on the island was mostly with gamma, gamma, gamma um, Geiger counters. You see? And in those days, the Geiger counters were really quite primitive. They couldn't measure these alpha and beta emitters. Um, and the other thing which we've now discovered as a result of getting a load of evidence, secret evidence out, you know, with a lot of fighting, is that the wind, although it was blowing off the offshore from the island at the time of the explosions, the jet stream was blowing in the opposite direction. So as the big mushroom cloud went up, it drifted across the island, away from it, and then it hit the jet stream and it was brought back onto the island again, you see. So there are lots of big questions. So it would have fallen as... So it would have fallen back as, as, as these little radioactive particles of uranium mixed in with all the cesium and all the other stuff that these bombs make. So these guys got quite... And in fact, they had lots of evidence of this, you know. We, we are, in the study that I did, they gave, they gave uh, an account of how they all had nosebleeds and they had rashes on their faces and their skin and they had a lot of diarrhea and the hair fell out and all this sort of stuff. But of course, it was not at the time it was not listened to. And if they if these servicemen went home, had children, yeah. some of whom were born with conditions similar to those of people who've been exposed to radiation, right? Can they sue the government? Have they sued the government? They haven't sued the government, and, they, and the answer is they can. They certainly can, and they could. But whether they will or not, I mean, a lot of them are very old now. But the children could maybe sue the that's government. What I was, that's what I'm yeah, saying. I mean, the could, children. could the children yes, sue the government? I think probably they could. I think, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not very terribly up in, in, in the law, but it seems to me that it is a tort. You know, Which is harm, isn't yeah, it? A it, harm. Is, it is a harm. So, you yeah. know, so they have been harmed as a result of something that the government did to their parents. And therefore, they should be able to get compensation for that. And is it likely that they would have deformed children? Yes. Well, well I mean, there's not, no question of likely. We know that that is the case. Because I, I did a study of the British nuclear test veterans in 2007. Um, and uh, we looked at their children and the grandchildren. Now, to my astonishment, what we found is that although the, chil the, the children had about an eight- or nine-fold excess 
uh, risk of congenital disease compared to the, the normal level that you find in Europe. But also the grandchildren had the same level. So it wasn't exactly the same. Exactly, it wasn't yeah, declining. Well, in fact, it, it was ninefold in the children and eightfold in the grandchildren. So within statistical range, that's the same level. You know? And that was quite surprising because people tend to think of genetic, like Mendel, you know, like the sweet peas and all that. They think that you, you know, if, you, if you marry somebody, then you get a half, and then they marry somebody and you get a quarter and all that stuff. Yes. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't. Got we know that it doesn't work like that because in the last 10, 15 years they've made discoveries of, uh, of, of a mechanism called genomic instability as a result of looking at the Chernobyl effects. Okay. And what they find is that if you, if you irradiate the parent, what you can get is, a, is a, it's like a switch. It's called genomic instability and the switch is thrown, not in everybody, but in, in a good proportion of people, uh, as a sort of evolutionary... Uh, evolutionary mechanism to get around a genetic stress. And what it does is it sends a message to the DNA to scramble. So what happens is that what used to be thought is like you would introduce, if you got some radiation, it would introduce genetic lesion X. And then, you know, the child would then have X, and then the grandchild would have X, so the genes go down like that. But it doesn't work like that. The way it works is you introduce genetic lesion SOS. And what that does is it makes the next generation just scramble. So you get X, Y, Z, P, Q, R, and so on. And, 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 that, and that SOS signal then goes to the following generation and it's so on. It's like sort of putting a wooden spoon in the mix, isn't it? It kind of is. It's, it's, uh, and, and, the, and the reason they believe that it happens is because it's an environmental, it's, it's an evolutionary advantage to a population. It's not an advantage to an individual. But for the population, if they scramble all the genes, then, they, then, then what happens is that they hope that one set of genes will be able to get through. That's, but if they're going to keep scrambling, though, even if you get one good set through, one like a new adaptation, something that's useful, like, I don't know, the ability to breathe underwater... Yes, yes, sure, yeah, sure. Well, you might, keep scrambling. But then it'll keep yeah. scrambling. So the person who could breathe underwater, they might have a child that can't breathe underwater. Well, of course, that's possible. I mean, in, but, but, but all I can tell you is that this is what has been discovered, and, and certainly this, this signal has been passed across the generation. In, okay. in, in through, through many generations. So you might think, or the people watching might think, that this is something that happened uh, quite a long time ago in the 50s. Yeah. And the 60s, I think? Well, mostly the big, the big, the, the Christmas Island test around 57, 58. Okay. Yeah. But also, but it's happening today, isn't it? With, oh, of course. With our troops yeah, sure, sure. in yeah. Bosnia, well, our, our that, troops well, in like, Afghanistan, all... Iraq, Libya. Yeah, this is also uranium. I think uranium is the great missing secret substance, myself. I, I, Why do you mean it's a great well, missing? The, the, because, because, you see, if you measure... The, the British government measures radioactivity around nuclear sites, and they measure radioactivity um, as a result of weapons fallout. You know? so, so when we look at all the paperwork associated with these court cases, you will be able to read uh, of measurements of cesium-137 and, and strontium-90 and a whole range of, of, of very exotic radioactive substances, ruthenium rhodium, all sorts of peculiar stuff, iodines and so on. But what nobody ever mentions is uranium. But actually, in terms of the total mass of material, and when the bomb goes bang, uranium is nearly all of it, nearly all of it. Not plutonium? No. Well, there, were, there, were, there are plutonium bombs, but, but there's, there's, the, the amount of plutonium is a lot less than the amount of uranium, because they use uranium as a sort of reflector. The idea is you have to constrain the, the, the fission or the fusion inside a little sphere. Otherwise, the, as it blows apart, you lose the critical mass. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So you have to keep it all in one place. And to do that, you put an enormous great lump of uranium around it. So when it goes bang, all that uranium in the, in the bomb mm -hmm. is turned into these little nanoparticles, so the same stuff that you get in Iraq. Uranium acts like a sort of safe that everything's locked in. That's correct, yeah, sure. Okay, and that's what, that's what of course, is this mutagenic... And, and it's the, I think it's the uranium that is, that, is, that is actually the main problem, because uranium binds to DNA, you see, it's chemically, it binds, it has a very high affinity for DNA. Uh, okay, and what, the other radioactive elements don't? No, they don't. No, uh, strontium-90 does, but the others don't. Yeah. And strontium-90 isn't that common? Strontium-90 is also a, 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 a fallout component, yeah, sure. And we think that strontium-90 is probably the main cause of the, of the uh, global cancer epidemic, which began in 1978 or 79. That was a consequence of the strontium-90 in the milk and in the people. I mean, we can, we, they've measured it in the people. They've measured it in the bones and the teeth and so on. Where, where's that? In the UK? Yeah. Where, where did that come from, then? It came from the global weapons testing, from Kazakhstan, from Nevada, from the Christmas, Christmas Island. The, the, the force of these explosions knocks it all up into the stratosphere, 
and then it gets into the stratospheric circulation and it slowly comes down. And then when it rains, it rains out and gets into the ground. The, the cows eat it, gets into the milk, you drink it, gets into your bones. Wow. It's okay. in you, for sure. Okay, we're going to go for a break now. If you'd like to send in your questions. One step beyond, in association with Nexus magazine. Welcome back to One Step Beyond with me, Theo Chalmers, and my special guest, Professor Dr. Christopher Busby. Okay, uh, just before the break then, we were talking about the effects of uranium and strontium-90. Um, can you describe what actually it does? You say it binds to DNA. Yes, um, one, of the, one of the main problems with the way in which radiation is assessed by the current uh, system of assessment, which is used to regulate nuclear power stations and and, and, and explain or predict the, the health effects um, is that it, it's a particularly physical way of understanding radiation. They, it just dilutes energy into the body. But of course, in reality, inside the body, these substances uh, are chemicals. These, these radioactive substances are chemicals, just like any other chemical. Chemicals that we have evolved. Well, like iron or something. Like iron or hydrogen or, ca or calcium or. or so they're elements. They're elements, that's yeah. right. But they're just. Elements which are uh, uh, unstable and suddenly decay and turn into something else and produce a, a, an alpha particle or a beta particle, which are like very highly energetic. Um, if you, you can think of them as bullets, and they fly through the, the tissue, producing lots of uh, little, little hot sparks called ions. And these hot sparks react with material in the body. Now, the problem is that some of these elements are, are just the same group or very similar to elements which are used inside our body and which we've evolved with, but, but they never existed prior to 1945 when the first fissioning of uranium took place. Well, they existed as, what, yellow cake uranium or something? Well, yes, it's the same stuff. You, so natural comes, minerals, it's, it's, but they were in a hole in the ground somewhere. It's a natural mineral, but the point is that when you, fiss when you have fission, when you, t when you extract the, the radioactive, uh, the, 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 the U-235, the, the fissionable component of it, which was done around about 1945. In a centrifuge. Yeah, in a centrifuge. Then this material, if you make it into a critical mass, you, it will actually explode, and it breaks down to these, all, all these, these, these new substances like strontium-90 mm -hmm. and cesium-137 and all these unstable elements, which, which, bind, which, which go into the body. They can be inhaled or ingested or eaten or whatever, or drunk. Um, and once they're inside the body, some of them bind to DNA because they have the same affinity for DNA that calcium has for DNA because calcium is normally what stabilizes the backbone of DNA. Mm -hmm. So if you take strontium, it's the same chemical group as calcium. And uranium also has a similar um, characteristic that it binds to DNA. The problem is that, that these substances are, are dangerously unstable. And having bound to DNA, they decay and give off these radioactive particles right into that particular part of the body where they're most effective. This is the genetic material. And they affect the chromosomes? Of course, they damage the chromosomes. And in fact, we know from studies that have been made of Gulf War veterans, for example, uh, and, and uh, the liquidators at, at Chernobyl, and also um, workers in, in uranium uh, mining facilities, that they have chromosome damage. So you can actually take the chromosomes, you can culture the chromosomes from their blood, in laboratories, and then you just look through a microscope and you can see some very strange chromosomes. Normally a chromosome is like an X. If you see mm -hmm. pictures of them in metaphase, you'll see that the chromosomes are like an X. The long ones and short ones and little ones, like the Y chromosome that make you a man. Uh -huh. But they're all like Xs. Um, and they have a central point of the X, which is called the centromere. But if you shoot, if you imagine that you shoot an alpha particle through them, you can sort of cut them, cut them, and then they can recombine in funny ways. And, they, and one of the ways they can recombine is to form what's called a dicentric. So instead of being an X, it's like an X with a circle and then another X all attached together, see? And uh, this sort of chromosome is associated with cancer and with genetic damage and all the rest of it. And they are caused by exposure to these internal radionuclides. That, okay. That's the problem. Well, let's look, at, let's look at depleted uranium, because depleted uranium has been used as, as a warhead, if you like, in, in uh, munitions. Correct. Quite a while, quite a few years now. Yes. And the advantages for munitions manufacturers is that, one, it gets rid of radioactive waste, which otherwise has to be stored yeah. at great cost over a long period of time. And two... 4.9 uh, million years. 4.9 million years. Well, that's the no, half-life. No, sorry, billion years. 4.9 4 billion years. 
okay, so that's quite a long time, isn't it? So the other advantage, of course, for man manufacturers of weapons is that because it's so dense, it pierces armour and Correct. houses yeah, and yeah. whatever else you want to pierce. Well, well armour is what you mainly want to pierce. And the reason it does that is, is not only because it's dense, but also because it burns in air. So when it hits something, uh, the energy involved causes it to, to, to burn. And it self-sharpens. It, it burns at an enormously high temperature, thousands of degrees, and it burns its way straight through the tank. I mean, I, I've been to Iraq and I've seen these tanks where they where they. They've been That's the one from the first Gulf War, is yes, it? The yes, ones yes. that were leaving That's Kuwait. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and they, um, it was a magical weapon. They won the war with it. I mean, armor. Uh, there's there's no point in having a tank anymore. You just come in with an A10 and one of those Gatling guns, and you fire these bullets, and it's only the size of my finger. One of these things. And it pops a hole straight through the tank, and then so it, none of this fancy armor, like Chobham armor or whatever it's called, yeah, nothing, nothing, of carbon fiber, nothing and can withstand this stuff. It's just absolutely, and the t they have ta they have sh tank shells as well. So this was the first sort of depleted uranium weapon, which was basically just what's called a penetrator. It's like a long rod, and they, and they just fire the rod, and the rod goes straight, and then burns, and there's a great bang because of all the the, 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 the burning. And the temperature, presumably. Of course, very high temperature, thousands of degrees, and it produces these very fine particles called nanoparticles, which are so small that they can go through the skin. They can go through any filter that you ever, that you ever imagine. So even though they're incredibly dense and therefore heavy, well, when you get because they're that, so small. Yeah, when you get down to that size, the concept of heavy is meaningless, you know, because, because when, when you're down to nanometer sizes, this is... This is like 10 to the minus 9 of a meter. So they're they're really small. they become an aerosol. Yeah, they are. They're like a gas. And they get buffeted by the air molecules, so they get kept up in the air. And they travel huge distances. We measured, after the second Gulf War, my colleague Sisha Morgan and I, we measured them in the filters at Aldermaston in, in, in Berkshire. So it came all the way from Iraq all the way to the United Kingdom. And we, we looked at all the air patterns as well to show that it was possible that that was the case. But over the period of the Second Gulf War, there was a huge increase in, these con in the concentration of uranium at the atomic weapons establishment in Aldermaston. So the fact that the uh, Americans, the British and so on, and the other allies in the Gulf War are using these weapons, isn't it? it's not just about, even, no, matter, no matter what you think about the people of Iraq or whatever they thought about the people of Iraq and what, uh, the sanctity of their lives was, um, they're destroying potentially human beings that's all over the planet. That's absolutely true. And in fact, uh, the, the, uh, one of the very interesting indicators of that is the sperm count in Israeli men, which was measured in, in uh, I think, 2007 it was, and they showed that the, constant, that the sperm count in Israeli men in Jerusalem had fallen catastrophically. Since, since the first use of, de of, of depleted uranium weapons, because it goes all over the Middle East. And they said that if, they, if these, these rates fell at a similar rate, by, by the year 2020, there would be no more Israelis. They would, they would be totally infertile. That would be it. Wow, that's very and, and I think this is happening all over the planet, which is why my message is very, very um, anguished, if you like, mm -hmm. you know, because all of this, this creation of this material, not, not just the uranium, but from Fukushima and so on, it's the sort of the human genome. What about, what about Fallujah? Let's talk about Fallujah, because Fallujah was a, 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 if you like, a rebel stronghold in Iraq yeah. that the Americans wanted to deal with, yes. or so it seemed. Now, you told me, and I've read elsewhere, that there is evidence that what was used in Fallujah was not just depleted, so-called depleted uranium. No. But live uranium. Well, live uranium, it, it was slightly enriched uranium is what we found. We did three studies there. The third one hasn't been published yet, but the first two uh, are sufficient to, to define what happened. There were, after the, after the, the um, United States-led forces uh, engaged in the Battle of Fallujah, which was 2004, mm -hmm. there, there, there began um, an increase in cancer, an enormous increase in cancer, levels that were higher even than after the Hiroshima bombing of, uh, of Japan. Okay? Mm -hmm. We had a 38-fold excess of leukemia in that population, unheard of uh, levels of, of cancer. And at the same time, we had a, a change in the sex ratio, the number of boys to the number of girls, and we also had um, uh, infant mortality increases and congenital malformation increases. Well, I, I use semi photographs, which we could be showing tonight, but... Probably not. Trust me, yeah. you don't want to see them. And, and I know Brian Hall that I interviewed, who, as you know, camped out in Parliament Square until his untimely death last year. Um, he had photographs of some of those deformed babies in Parliament Square, and it was shocking. 
It is shocking. And this is happening not just occasionally, but a lot in these places. Oh, it's, where... it's ongoing. It's ongoing. Anyway, the point is that we, there, we, in order to find out what the cause was, we took hair samples from the parents of the children with congenital malformations. And, and, and to get back to your point, what we found, to our astonishment, was enriched uranium, not depleted uranium. And it so has a different signature. It, it has a different signature, yeah. You can actually measure the isotopic ratio by measure, counting the atoms, and that's what we did as an instrument called a mass spectrometer which enables you to count the atoms of 235 and compare them to the atoms of 238. And you've got your own mass spectrometer? No, no, I've got a gamma spectrometer. The mass oh, spectrometer is a great, huge, enormous lump, very expensive thing. I would, I would quite like to have one if anybody out there wants to buy me one, I have to say. But, uh, but they cost rather a lot of money. Okay, so well, we use one in Germany. So, okay, but you, you tested your samples from Fallujah. Absolutely. And yeah, you found... Yeah, yeah. We found, we found enriched uranium. Enriched. And, we also, and we also, incidentally, were, which I thought was rather clever, I have to say, looked along the hair of the women who had long hair. And so, as you know, hair grows at a certain rate, one centimetre a month it is, in fact. So by, by looking at the end of the hair of a woman who had very long hair, we were able to go right back to 2005. And, and what, what we found was that the uranium in the hair was going up as you went back. So that means it was from the Fallujah battle, this uranium. In 2004? Correct. Yeah. Okay, so so the, knowingly, the Americans, because this was an American assault, yes. were using live uranium. They Surely using... this should be the headline in tomorrow's newspapers. I, I, we tried to get it into all the newspapers. In the end, the only people that, that and quite fortuitously, I was phoned up by Russia Today, who wanted, a, wanted me to interview them about something completely different, <clears throat> and I said, look, you know, we've got this story. And, they, and so they said, OK. So I, I took, put it out on Russia Today, but none of the British newspapers. It was sent to, to, to two major newspapers. They wouldn't touch it. Which they, two? Let's name them. OK. Uh, well, um, it went to The Independent, uh, and it went to Robert Fisk, who said he was going to do the story. Uh -huh. uh, and then nothing happened, nothing happened. And then, then after, after about a month of it not happening, and I talked to also Patrick Coburn, who'd done another story in The Independent for, about the same story, mm -hmm. uh, the earlier one, you know, the, the, the actual epidemiological study we did. Yeah. They, they covered that. We had front pages and everything. Mm -hmm. And then I gave it to Jonathan Leake, uh, who's also a kind of guy who's, who's, who's done the stories for me before in the Sunday Times. And that disappeared as well. So I'm pretty sure that there's some kind of enormous uh, pressure on the British newspapers, the major newspapers, to keep this kind of thing out. Because you would think, as you said, this is like kind of a major story. Dump, yes, using live uranium on a civilian population, no matter how many you know, so-called rebels or Al-Qaeda or mm. whatever you want to call them, are amongst that population. Well, the interesting question is, what is the weapon? That really is what we need to know. Because, because nobody would... I mean, you don't want to use enriched uranium against people because it's like shooting your enemy with diamonds. It's very expensive stuff. So you would want to know quite what the weapon was that they were using. Well, perhaps it was nearly depleted uranium. Well, that's one possibility, that they were just covering their tracks. I, I think that is a reasonable explanation because after the first Gulf War, there was an awful lot of aggro about depleted uranium and there an awful lot of NGOs who were trying to ban depleted uranium weapons and they're kind of succeeding. And I rather feel... Well, they're still being used. They were used in Libya, weren't they? I, well, nobody really knows. We haven't got any... I mean, I, I'm going to get some samples and try and check it out. But, but I wouldn't be keen on... I wouldn't be looking for depleted uranium anymore because I think they've been not using that since 2003 and probably to cover their, back, cover their tracks. But I, didn't I also read that they're using it in small arms fire now, small arms ammunition? Yes, yeah, that's what we think so. They're, they're patterns. We've, we've discovered patterns where they put uranium in the warheads of... of, of, of um, of, of ground, 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 ground to ground weapons, yeah, sure. Um, and also we found, yeah, no, this is the other thing, we, we, uh, we've also found it in the Lebanon, so the Israelis are using it also. We find enriched uranium in the Lebanon. And that's for sure, absolutely for sure, because we got a bomb crater and we took stuff out of the bomb crater and we measured it in two different laboratories using two different techniques. So the Israelis are using, you're saying... The Israelis are using live uranium against the Lebanon. The Lebanon. They did. That's right. Yeah. When was that? 2006. That was when they had that battle. Yeah, that they was lost. the incursion into into, in the, into the Hezbollah, um, uh, the big attacks there, which they had to they had to back off in the end, didn't they? Remember? Yeah, I do remember. Yeah. Well, again, that should be headline news, shouldn't it? Well, it was actually. Uh, Robert Fisk did put it on the front page of the Independent. What? That it was live uranium. That it, that it was enriched uranium. Yeah. Really? I'm sorry, I never saw yeah. that. Uh, and so that was why I sent. That's why I sent this news story to, to, to him. You know, and he said, "Oh yeah, well." And he was going to go out to Fallujah and do it and everything, but nothing happened. 
nothing happened. So I think there's some big dogs out there at the moment, you know, who are tr stop, stopping any of this stuff coming out. And I, I see this as a sort of parallel uh, pressure that's coming forward at the same time as, as, as the, the so-called nuclear renaissance. You know, it's all part of the same thing, really, I think. Well, you mean this push to have new power stations? Yes, that's right. Stations. Yeah, you see, because the point is, the point is this, that, no, sorry to interrupt, but this is no, the no, thing, sure. you know, that if uranium is causing these effects at the low doses, you know, conventionally expressed, then it has all sorts of ramifications for other aspects of using radiation. Because what might have previously seemed to be relatively safe suddenly becomes... Of course. Course. Very unsafe. That's right. And, and we know that all this stuff comes out of nuclear power stations all the time. And they're perpetually telling us that, you know, there's no problem in nuclear power stations. Absolutely safe. Nobody dying. Blah, blah, blah. We're going to talk about that when we come back from the next break. Uh, please text your messages and questions to 86686 with the word beyond. And we'll see you after this break. <laughs> One Step Beyond with me, Fia Chalmers, and my special guest, Professor Dr. Christopher Busby. Okay, um, I think we need to move on in the last section and talk about Fukushima. Now, I know you've written a book here. This is, uh, this is the cover, Fukushima and Health, What to Expect. It is available, isn't it? Yes, yes, of course. And, and this is the uh, proceedings of the third international conference of the European Committee on Radiation Risk, Lesbos, Greece, May 5th and 6th, 2009. So, okay... Um, I read a lot of different stuff about what's happening in um, Japan after Fukushima. Uh, you've been there, you've measured stuff. I know you're getting people to send you air filters from cars yes. from all over Japan, which you'll analyse on your mass spectrometer. Uh, gamma spectrometer. Gamma spectrometer, yeah. I beg your pardon. What's happening? Well, the... Um the first thing that's happening is that the, is that the uh, IAEA and the Japanese authorities have been lying. That's the International Atomic the International Energy Atomic Authority Energy Association uh, have, have been not telling the truth about the severity right from the beginning, and 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 to extract the truth from them has been like dragging teeth. Um, I was one of the first people to say that this was a really serious accident, and I said this on the BBC and on ITV right at the beginning and later on did various uh, programs where I analysed what was happening. But all along the line, just like with Chernobyl, what we found was that people were saying that there was no problem, when actually there was a problem. And, th and this, in my view, is, is criminal negligence, because people could have got out who didn't get out. People could have run away from this radiation. Now, when I went there, I measured ser serious levels of contamination as far south as southern Tokyo. And uh, I went to... And that's how many miles from Tokyo? That's about... Th uh, 350 kilometers south, that sort of thing. And I went to within uh, 100 kilometers uh, um, of, of, the, uh, of the site, and I found quite high levels of radiocesium there as well. And slowly people have been measuring it, and, we, and, and the picture that's emerged is that the contamination there, in the sense of health, is much more serious than, than Chernobyl. And the reason for that is because the populations are very much bigger. The population of Tokyo is about 35 million people. Population out of the, t the 200 kilometer radius from Fukushima is about 10 million people. This is an awful lot of people being contaminated with these substances. An awful lot. Many, many more people than, than from Chernobyl. Describe what happened in Fukushima. Well, what happened, as far as we know, is that, uh, that and, and of course we don't know the truth. They, were, that, that they haven't even been able to, to figure out the truth because they can't get in close enough because the radiation is so great. A lot of this stuff is melted. And there are four, there are four there reactors. Are four, there are four reactors, okay. And, and there, there have been meltdowns in, and now in all of them, in all of those reactors. And not only were there meltdowns in the, in the reactor pressure vessels, but each of these reactors had large tanks on top of the reactor containing the spent fuel because they've got nowhere to put the fuel now. So they store it on top of the reactor. So when the reactors explode, whether it's a hydrogen explosion or a nuclear explosion, the explosion causes these, these, these 
very radioactive fuel rods to fly up in the air and go all over the place. It's, uh, it's uh, unbelievable, unbelievable. And we think it's a nuclear explosion in at least one of those reactors anyway. And, they, and they, the fuel they were using in these re reactors was a very dirty fuel called MOX. Mixed well, in oxide. one of the reactors. In my, in the, in Just the one of them. The three, yeah. They were using uh, mixed oxide fuel which contains plutonium. And this, this is probably why there was a nuclear explosion in, in the waste fuel tank of that particular reactor. Because of the plutonium. Yeah, and that's the one that where you see, if, if you look at the YouTube videos of it happening, you see that one, there's an enormous explosion which goes right up out of the frame of the picture, yeah. and, and uh, that's certainly not a hydrogen explosion. And it would be easy to tell by analysing the uh, xenon isotopes, which is what we did after Chernobyl. In St. Petersburg, uh, the, some Russian colleagues of mine measured the xenon isotopes and was able to show that that was actually a, a, a prompt criticality. It was a nuclear explosion, not a hydrogen explosion. So Chernobyl, Chernobyl was a yes, nuclear explosion? Yes, it was definitely a nuclear explosion because they've measured the ratio of the xenon isotopes. And has that been admitted by the Ukrainians? No, no, nobody admits anything in this game. There's just a massive cover-up all over the place all the time. It's quite serious. Mm. And it's not just Ukraine that's... No, 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 it's not, even, it's not even it's Baltic Ukraine. states, it's, actually, it's Belarus. Well, it's gone everywhere. I mean, in fact, I, we know that it went, it's gone to Sweden. Interestingly enough, there was a paper written by a, a colleague uh, called Martin Tondell, a young man, who, did, who, who studied the contamination of northern Sweden and showed that there was an 11% increase in cancer in northern Sweden per, per 100 kilo becquerels of exposure. And so we can use that. In fact, we used that in, in a paper that I wrote recently yeah, to, to predict... The, 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 the cancer yield uh, in the 200 kilometer area, I predicted uh, that there would be 200,000 extra cancers in that area in, in, the, uh, in, the, one, in the 200 kilometer area for, uh, for outside Fukushima using this data. So, so what would your message be to the people of that island of Japan? I've, island? Told, I've told them again and again and again that two things they must do, and th these are real things, these things they should do. The first of all, they should get out. Absolutely they should get out, they should run. They should, should run. leave that island. Yes, and I said, right, well, well I don't know about the island. They should certainly get further away than, than so the south of Tokyo. And if I were living in Tokyo and I was there in Tokyo, I would get out. And I told them, hundreds of people email me and say, what shall I do, Dr. Busby? And I say, get out. But if you can't get out, because it's not so easy, and one of them said to me, well, we can't get passports, we can't, you know. They can't get passports. Well, they can't, they, they can go to other countries, but they can only stay there for a certain length of time. You know, it's, it's this immigration business. You know, people, so they said that it's very difficult to get out of Japan and to find somewhere to go to. Do you think that the Japanese government is, is making it difficult deliberately? I think they are. I think the Japanese government are freaking out, frankly. And they, and, uh, anyway, so that's the first thing they should do, is get out. The second thing they should do is they can actually take uh, uh, calcium supplements. Now the calcium supplements are just ordinary calcium tablets, they can buy them in the health food shops and these tablets will help to block the access of the strontium and the uranium to the DNA. This is, this is, this is such a simple thing that they can do. I thought it, it was iodine. Cost... No, no, yeah, iodine, surely. They can t but the, the, but the, the, the half-life of iodine is very rapid, eight days, you know, so the iodines have all gone. And so they've either affected the thyroid or they haven't affected the thyroid. There's nothing you can do about that. The government should have handed out tablets. It turns out they didn't. That's what everybody says. But what they can do is with the long-lived isotopes, these the uraniums and the strontium, as they can reduce the access to the DNA by taking calcium, calcium. tablets. Yeah. Just calcium? Well, just calcium. A, can they not just drink milk? No, because the milk's going to have the strontium and the uranium in it, of course. That's the point. And presumably the calcium tablets don't? No, that's right. Made abroad, or yeah, all of those things. So, is calcium easy to assimilate? Yes, yes, it's ha totally harmless. People take the calcium tablets for osteoporosis. They sell them in the in the health food shops. So they have no side effects, whatever. And you don't want to take too many. Just so take a, take take one calcium tablet a day. What happens if you take too many? Them. Then you get no, nothing happens. Some other no, that, no, really, that you can't overdose on calcium. It's not possible. Okay, so okay, let's say that somebody's watching this program who's who's on a business trip to Japan. Yes. You would say to them that they should go to the chemist, buy some calcium tablets? No, no, I should say to them that they shouldn't go on the business trip to Japan. That's what I'd first of all say. Secondly, if they do go there, they should try to eat food which is sourced from somewhere else, uh, you know, that they know where it comes from. Well, that's going to be pretty hard to do, isn't it? Well, that's what I tried to do, I have to say, when I was there. You know, and also what I did, I mean, I can tell you, I took this very seriously. A lot of people that I know who visited Chernobyl after Chernobyl are now dead. A lot of people who went out to Iraq with cameras to, to, to look at the battlefields and to talk about uranium effects and all the rest of it are now dead. This is, this is, like not, this is not a joke. This is very serious business. 
I, I burnt my clothes. So I went out there, I took one set of clothes and I, and, and I took another set of clothes in a plastic bag. And when I came back, I burnt my clothes and put the other set of clothes on. Because these nanoparticles, they get everywhere. And then you've got nanoparticles on you and your children, you know, and you go did like you, that. Did you wear a mask? Uh, no, I didn't wear a mask. But a mask is hopeless for these things. It, 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 even those things that the Japanese wear, they just go right through those things. So you take your life in your hands, and I did take my life in my hands, but I didn't go that close. But you've got a Geiger counter. Oh, yeah, sure. I so did. have you tested yourself subsequently? You can't, you can't measure these nanoparticles, that, because the, ra the, the amount of radioactivity involved in the particles is too small. All you can do is measure, if there's a hell of a lot of them there, you'll get a, me you'll get a signal. But just the sort of little stuff floating about in the air, it's, it's invisible death. Keep away from it. So you, you, what you're saying is that you've got to... Uh... You've got to take calcium if you if you have to go somewhere. If you have to. Go. Or if something happens, say here. Yeah. Then I would take calcium, sure. Calcium. Absolutely. So so you would recommend people buy calcium and store it because it's presumably it lasts indefinitely. It lasts forever, sure. Of course it does. Yeah. And it's cheap. It's cheap as dirt. You know. So but you could go to. You could go to chemist. You could go, well, no, you don't do it. You go to the health food shops. You go to these people like Holland and Barrett, and they'll give you a huge, huge bottle of calcium tablets. Calcium and magnesium they are, because the magnesium helps the assimilation of the calcium. So you get calcium and magnesium tablets, but sometimes they come with vitamin D, so you don't want the ones with vitamin D, especially for children. Children shouldn't have vitamin D, so you get the ones without vitamin D. Isn't that the one you make from sunlight anyway? Vitamin D, yeah, sure, but if you have too much vitamin D that you take, it can affect your bones if you're growing, that's the problem. And, and how effective is, is the calcium then? Well, studies, studies were done in, in, uh, in the 60s, funnily enough, because of, uh, of, well, not funnily enough, because of all the strontium that was coming down in the 60s from the weapons fallout. Mm. At least five or six scientific papers were done where they fed calcium tablets to human beings or rats, and then they, gave, they exposed them to strontium, or they were exposed to strontium, and they measured the strontium in the bone or in the urine and so on, and they found that they were. They pushed the strontium out. They were. So it's never too late to take the strontium then? The, the calcium tablets. No, it's, it's not never too late. No, no, the calcium no, it's never too late. And in fact, in my opinion, you should take cesium tablets. But the trouble is the government won't license anybody to make cesium tablets, although cesium is actually quite harmless, you know, so you could easily make these. But uh, there are all sorts of peculiar regulations in, in these areas of manufacturing tablets and so on. So, you know, you get, you're in a rather, rather odd area because, because it's this sort of quasi... Uh, Medical, you see, and once you're in the medical area, there are all sorts of funny rules and regulations. What about the risk to troops that have been in these places where the bombs have gone off? And well, you've got two sets of troops, really. You've got the troops from from the test veterans, which I talked about, but the but the Gulf War veterans suffer from a disease called Gulf War syndrome, yeah. and this emerged in the 90s, and that's almost certainly a result of exposure to uranium. Uranium gets it goes up the nose, it gets through the olfactory bulb into the brain. And goes into the brainstem and it destroys cells. And, and we've done, not we've done, but a chap called Cheney in America has done nuclear magnetic resonance measurements of brainstem cells' uh, viability, whether they're alive or not, in Gulf War veterans and compared them with controls and shown that the brainstem is damaged. And that's why they have this Gulf War syndrome. And so it's we, nothing to do with the vaccinations they were given, because one of no, the theories no, no, is no, it's not. they were given these powerful vaccination right. cocktails. Yeah, yeah, sure. No, it's, it's, it's well, well, to be honest, nobody knows exactly. But, but the evidence is that it is the uranium. Because, because, and the French have done work on, on rats and, and caused, uh, given rats, uh, in, in, allowed rats to inhale uranium and shown that they have sort of problems with their psychology and their sleep, the sleep patterns are affected and all sorts of uh, uh, brainstem type housekeeping pro properties that, 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 that the uranium affects. And also in the Gulf War veterans, we found high levels of congenital malformation in their children. And that's the other thing that it does, of course, is it does the chromosomes. And because of the chromosomes, you get damage to the sperm, and then so they get, they get children with deformities, just like they do in Iraq. But here, is, here we're talking about America, the American troops. So what about the English troops? Were, have been well, presumably, but nobody studied the English troops, but presumably the same. Sure. So if, if somebody's watching who was in the armed services... Uh, in one of these countries where depleted uranium weapons were used, yeah. or possibly live uranium weapons were used. Should they not have children, in your opinion? 
No, I think I think you can have children, but you need to. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's stochastic. You so it's like it's, it's under the play of chance. It just means that if you did an epidemiological study, you'd find there was a higher probability. You know, so you wouldn't say don't have children. But what you would say is if you do have children and they turned out to have something wrong with them, the cause is almost certainly going to be your exposure to these uranium weapons. That's the point. And but the other point that you made is that this goes down the generation. Yes, it does. That's right. That's right. That's so there is that, no coming back. That's what this. we find with the test veterans. Yeah. Well, well, the, the, it seems that the one way that this sort of genetic damage gets out of a population is if you die before issue. That's how it goes. Without having children. That's right. That's right. That's the only way of getting these sorts of genetic damage components out of out of people. So we're we're we're, we're increasing the general genetic damage component of the human race, and of course all other animals as well. And the only way that it's going to go down is if people aren't going to have babies. But I have to tell you, it's getting difficult to have babies nowadays, okay? And all this IVF stuff. I mean, when I was young, you know, it wasn't so difficult to have babies. Just shook, shook some girl's hand and she was pregnant. Now, nowadays, you know, you have to go along to hospitals and get IVF treatment, goodness knows what. Because the sperm rate is being attacked. Well, and the eggs too, and the eggs, you know, it's all, it's all damage. I, my, my colleague, Hagen Scherb, has measured the, the sex ratio of, of huge populations in Europe and America all over the place. And what he's found is that after every one of these injections of radioactivity into the biosphere, there's been a shift in the number of boys born to the number of girls. Chris, on that note, we're going to have to end. And thank you very much for watching and to those who texted. I'm sorry I couldn't read out any text. We've had some problems tonight, technical problems, and we're still having them, actually. Um, but we are going to have another hour now on the Edge on um, Edge Extra on edgemediatv.com for those who subscribe and I look forward to welcoming you back maybe next week and until then may the God you seek be you good night